1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning in verse 18. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. For it's written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Where's the wise man? Where's the scribe? Where's the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. To Jews, a stumbling block, and to Gentiles, foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. You know, in 1857, during an excavation on the Palatine Hill in Rome, one of the seven hills overlooking Rome, um, in the excavation of the Domus Gelatiano, a house in the imperial palace of Emperor Caligula, a piece of graffito was discovered in the plaster of a wall. It was come to be, it's come to be known as the Alexamenos graffito. It dates to somewhere around AD 200, and it may in fact be the earliest depiction of Jesus. It's a caricature, and it's not flattering. The crude drawing shows a figure hanging from a cross with a man at the base of the cross looking up with arm raised in a posture of worship. And then the scribbled text in the plaster, it's in the Greek, and it reads, Alexamenos sebeta theon. Alexamenos worships his God. Now, you have no doubt seen many medieval uh, scenes and depictions of the crucifixion crucifixion reverently illustrated, let's say, in paintings or in stained glass windows, maybe in ancient books. But what separates this depiction from those that you are familiar with is that the person on the cross has the head of a donkey. See, as it turns out, Jews were lampooned for centuries as those who worshipped donkeys. Now, Christians were lumped in with them since they are seen as a sect of Judaism. But the message is quite clear that the person who scratched this cartoon on the wall, he was ridiculing Alexamenos for worshiping not so much a donkey, but a crucified man. See, what Christians see as the greatest act of self-sacrificing love, freely offered by the Son of God, the Lord of glory, by which their sins were atoned and salvation was made possible, the world sees as folly and utter foolishness. On the one hand, the crucifixion of Jesus is, is understood by Christians to be, the, to be essential to the salvation of all men everywhere. On the other hand, to the rest of the world, it is both offensive and absurd and all who embrace it should be held in contempt for believing something so primitive and irrational. They are fools themselves for finding value in that which is so contrary to sound wisdom and enlightened judgment. And Paul sums up the world's view of the cross in verse 18. The word of the cross is foolishness. I want to speak to you this morning about the folly of the cross. The cross is not foolish at all. It is, as Paul says in verse 24, the wisdom of God and the power of God, but only to those who are being saved. But Paul can see that, that in the minds and the hearts of the Corinthians, the wisdom of this world is competing with the wisdom of God in the cross. And though they're quarreling, and through their quarreling, it's become it's become evident that they have absorbed the ideals and the values of the pagan world out of which they have been saved. And through the gospel, through the gospel God brought an end to human self-sufficiency. 
Apart from Christ, man can do nothing to free himself from sin. He cannot make his way to God. He cannot overcome the consequences of his own sin. He cannot be good enough or do enough good to merit God's favor. And God, therefore, nullified human wisdom and judgment by declaring the death of his son as the only way to him. See, the gospel is not some new form of divine wisdom that allows for human judgments or evaluations of God's actions. No, the gospel is the divine antithesis to human wisdom. You know, there are trends that flow through a culture that become all the rage and then just as quickly they become something so out of, so out of vogue that you, you cringe to see it. Every generation has them. I would say they're most prominent among the youth where something is cool one week and then uncool the next. For example, one of the ways that I could prove myself totally uncool right now is to dab. Dabbing is a dance move. It's originated uh, by the rapper Skippa de Flippa. You all know him. Some argue it was Migos, but we won't get into that controversy right now. Now, part of the reason why it would be so uncool for me to dab right now is because I'm 50 years old. But dabbing is so last year, guys. Dabbing is so last year. Now, when I say that the gospel is the antithesis to human wisdom, don't try to relate it in any way to be something that is considered uncool. That is not what we're talking about. We're not talking about the dab being the equivalent of the cross in its uncoolness. First of all, the cross was never cool. The cross was never acceptable. The cross may be a fashion symbol today, but it was never fashionable. The cross was never trending. There was no makeover for the cross that could make it something that was not repulsive in every possible way. The horrors of the cross are so beyond our 21st century senses that I doubt any of us here would be able to watch what they did and not be traumatized for the rest of your life. And so there was nothing whatsoever acceptable about the cross except for the purpose of publicly executing a low-life criminal in the most shameful, painful, and dehumanizing way possible. And so it only follows that in the first century, no man in their right mind or otherwise would ever have dreamed up the plan that God came up with for the redemption of humanity. No one would ever believe in a God who died like a common criminal on a Roman cross. The offense of the cross was too preposterous to be acceptable to Jews and Greeks alike. And for this reason, the Corinthians were trying to make the cross more acceptable. They were trying to wrap the shameful, bloody cross of Christ in a cloak of divine wisdom and worldly rhetoric in the hope of making it somehow less offensive and more palatable to their fellow Corinthians. And that's why they were ready to move on, you know, from the mere milk that Paul had offered them in his initial preaching of the gospel. See, it was time to move on to things more suitable for ones as spiritual as they had clearly become. But Paul knows that to move on from the cross is to abandon Christ and the gospel altogether. To remove the cross from the gospel is to remove the power from the gospel. A gospel without the cross is a neutered gospel that is unable to save men. And so Paul wastes no time in presenting his argument to them about the centrality of the gospel. Not only is the gospel crucial for addressing the problem of their divisiveness, it is crucial for every problem that they are facing in the church. There is no moving on from the cross. And so the message of the gospel, at the center of which stands the cross of Christ, it is, it is absolute, it is fundamental, and it stands in opposition to the merely human wisdom that they had embraced. There is no reconciling the cross with the world. That is as true today as when Paul wrote this letter. There is no way to preach the gospel of a crucified Savior 
faithfully without also inviting the scorn and the ridicule of the world. And yet whenever and wherever this gospel is faithfully preached, God continues to demonstrate his power to radically save and transform sinners from every nation, every tribe, who speaks every tongue on this planet. He delivers people out of every form of spiritual bondage, blindness, and rebellion. The Corinthians needed to be brought back to the cross. And so do we. And so Paul sets out to correct their thinking and convince them of this important truth. The same cross that the world sees as utter foolishness is the wisdom and power of God to those being saved. The same cross that the world sees as utter foolishness is the wisdom and the power of God to those being saved. I want to give you five truths about the cross that explain why the world sees the cross as utter foolishness. The cross divides the world's people. The cross destroys the world's wisdom. The cross draws the world's fools. The cross defies the world's expectations. And the cross disproves the world's perceptions. Let me take a moment to pray, and then we'll take a closer look at the folly of the cross. Heavenly Father, thank you that you have opened our eyes. We who were just as willing to ridicule Christ and Christians and the cross, all of it. We once blasphemed your name. Now we sing it with tears in our eyes and joy in our hearts. And that's all because of you. Because you demonstrated your power in us. You showed us mercy. You gave us grace. And it's all through the preaching of your gospel, the gospel of a crucified Christ, so offensive, so foolish, but lovely and beautiful. Only you could do this. It's your wisdom in contrast to our foolishness. Thank you for the grace you have shown us. Would you show us grace this morning to let us take in all that we hear and let it continue to transform our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So Paul began his letter by addressing the divisions he was told existed in the church. Uh, but his, his plan is not to speak directly to these internal rivalries that has developed, but to use the opportunity to begin addressing the greater theological underlying, the theological issue that is underlying all the quarreling and the boasting that's going on in the church. And that is the nature of of the gospel itself. So he first set out to show them that the only way to build unity in Christ's church is to preach Christ's cross. And they were to preach this gospel simply, confidently. And Paul is calling them out for thinking that they had a better, more effective gospel than that which spoke of the cross. And now in place of the cross, they were substituting their own superficial efforts of persuasion. See, they were to preach the gospel, as Paul says, not in cleverness, of logos. It's the word there. Not in cleverness of logos, so that the word of Christ would not be made void. For, Paul says here in verse 18, the logos of the cross, the word of the cross, is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it's the power of God. See, there is a logos, a word, a message, a wisdom, right? There is a logos that belongs to the world's wisdom. And there's a Logos whose content is the cross. And Paul is contrasting the two here. And these two messages are mutually exclusive. And they divide the world into two groups. And so the first reason that the world regards the cross as utterly foolish is because the cross divides the world's people. The cross divides the world's people. And this division, it comes about because of three realities connected to the cross. It's shameful stigma. It's offensive message. And it's inescapable judgment. Now, as I already indicated in my introduction, it's almost impossible for us today, today to... to to really comprehend the full obscenity of crucifixion in the ancient world. So the first reason of the, that the cross divides the world's people 
is because of the shameful stigma of the cross. When Paul came to Corinth, he preached the message of a Savior who had been crucified by Rome. And in so doing, Paul was attributing to Jesus what was well known to be a particularly cruel and shameful death, which as a rule was reserved for hardened criminals, irredeemable slaves, and rebels of the Roman Empire. Cicero, the Roman politician and lawyer, around 63 BC, denounced the crucifixion of a Roman citizen, saying the very word cross should be far removed, not only from the person of a Roman citizen, but from his thoughts, his eyes, and his ears. Cicero was simply voicing the sentiments of Roman society, which went as far back even as the 3rd century BC, when the very word crucify was considered an obscene word that no cultured person would say in polite society. In one ancient document, a Roman prostitute hurled this insult, perhaps the lewdest that she could think of, right? You know that moment when you're trying to come up with the worst possible insult for somebody? Well, apparently she came up with it. She said, go get yourself crucified. The Roman philosopher Seneca described what he witnessed at the crucifixion, saying, I see the stakes there, not, not of one kind, but many. Some victims are placed head down. Some have spikes driven through their genitals. Others have their arms stretched out on a gibbet. One famous second century Roman orator said, Christians put forward sick delusions and a senseless and crazy superstition which leads to an, to an old womanly superstition or to the destruction of all true religion. Not least among the monstrosities of their faith is the fact that they worship one who has been crucified. Their ceremony center on a man put to death for his crime and on the fatal wood of the cross. Augustine preserved an oracle of Apollo, the Greek god, recorded by the philosopher Porphyry. The oracle records Apollo's answer when a man asked what he could do to dissuade his wife from Christian belief. Apollo apparently held out little hope and he said, let her continue as she pleases, persisting in her vain delusions and lamenting in song a God who died in delusions, who was condemned by judges, whose verdict was just and executed. Think of how Christians speaking about their God suffering death by crucifixion, how it would have clashed with the far more appealing religious symbols that the people of Corinth would have been familiar with, like stalks of grain or baskets of fruit to represent life and power, or other symbols of fertility that were well known at this time. D.A. Carson, he suggests that, that presenting the cross in some kind of a positive light would be like equating good with one of the gas chambers at Auschwitz. It would be like saying that the mushroom cloud over Hiroshima was beautiful. See, the contrast is a complete paradox. And with these few examples, we can see that the contempt with which the average Corinthian would have viewed Christianity precisely because the cross was at the heart of the Christian message. Christians were proclaiming a crucified Jew from some backwater of the Roman Empire as a divine being, God's Son, the Lord of all, and coming judge of the world. He was sent to earth, rejected by his people. He came to save, deserted by his followers, executed by the proper authorities, and apparently he was powerless to stop any of it. It must have been thought by any cultured, educated man to be utter madness and folly, worthy only of scorn and derision and certainly not worthy of any consideration. And yet, we never find Paul referring to Jesus' death as an embarrassment or sweeping the crucifixion under the rug as an unfortunate mishap that was only remedied by the glories of the resurrection. Paul never says that he preached the resurrected Christ. He says in 1 Corinthians 2, 2, I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. He puts it right in their face. 
crucifixion and resurrection, they, they go together, right? And Paul's going to elaborate on that in chapter 15 when we get there. But he proclaimed the cross as repugnant and shameful as it was to those in the first century. It was central to his preaching. Now this leads us to the second reason why the cross divides the world's people. The shame of death on a cross was bad enough. But that was not the primary cause of the offense. What offended people more than the manner of Christ's death was the offensive message of the cross. Now notice what Paul says is foolishness. He doesn't say the cross is foolishness. What does he say is foolishness? The word of the cross. What's the word of the cross? Well, when the Apostle Paul wrote this phrase, he had something in mind. What is the message of the cross that so offends men of this world? Well, it's what he calls in verse 17, the gospel. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not in cleverness of speech, so that the cross of Christ would not be made void. Paul links the preaching of the gospel with the word of the cross, which he then refers, he links it to the cross of Christ, which he then in verse 18 says, he calls it the word of the cross. And so the message or the word of the cross is the gospel that Paul preached. Now, what is the essential content of the gospel that Paul preached. Well, in verse 23, Paul summarized the substance of his preaching as Christ crucified. So the word of the cross, which is synonymous with the gospel, is accurately summarized as the message of Christ crucified. The word of the cross is the message about the reality of our sin and the offense of our sin to God. It's the message that Christ died on that cross as an atoning sacrifice for our sin, and one must believe fully in his death as the only means of escaping the wrath of a holy and just God. And so the message of the cross that Paul preached in Corinth, it's the same message that he proclaimed elsewhere and that he recorded for us in different letters that he wrote. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13, if you'd like to turn there. Galatians 3, 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it's written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. See, the message of the cross, the gospel, it's the proclamation that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, bore the curse of the law vicariously, that is, in the place of another. So the curse of the law, that's the pronouncement of death upon everyone guilty of breaking God's law. And James has made it clear that's true of all of us. You break it once, you're guilty of breaking it all. So he's talking about all of us here. We are all under curse. We're under curse by nature and we're under curse by practice. We're guilty in Adam. From, for we came from him. His guilt is passed on to us. But we're guilty a thousand times over by our own sinful choices. And the curse of God is the judgment of God, the forsaking of us by God, justly due to us because of our sin, because of our lawlessness, because of our law-breaking. And the message of the cross is the proclamation that Christ redeemed us from that curse by taking our place and bearing our curse. And this was the gospel that Paul preached. And the reason why he said at the end of the letter, after having made his argument for the sufficiency of Christ's death to justify sinners, in chapter 6, verse 14 of Galatians, he says, but may it never be that I would boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. See, there's nothing vague about what Paul preached. He pointed to our need of a Savior because of our having broken God's law, and he proclaimed God's provision of a Savior in Jesus Christ, whose substitutionary death on the cross redeemed us from the curse of the law. Look at 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. Second Corinthians 5, verse 21 says, He made him who knew no sin, 
to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. For Paul, the word of the cross is this statement that God in Christ was reconciling the world to himself, which he did by imputing or crediting to his son all of our sin, making him the greatest sinner who has ever existed of all time. He never sinned himself, not in any way. He obeyed the law of God perfectly. He carried out the will of his heavenly Father completely, but he has made sin on our behalf. And in the courtroom of heaven, he is charged with the legal liability of the sins of all who who will ever come to trust in him. And for these sins, he's punished by God. That's your sins. That's my sins. That's why he was on the cross, bearing our curse, bearing our sin. Your sin, the sin that you committed today on your way to church, the sin you committed last night in the privacy of your bedroom, The sin that you commit when you're out in public with your friends who don't know you here. Christ died on the cross for that. And then we have in chapter 15, jumping ahead in our book, chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians. He expands, he makes it abundantly clear the meaning of this phrase, the word of the cross. What is he talking about? The first four verses. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you which also you received and which also you stand, by which also you are saved. If you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. See, the message of the cross, it's the declaration that in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, God has provided a fully adequate sacrifice for the penalty and the punishment of sin. It's the summing up of all the facts of the life and the ministry of Jesus that led up to his betrayal by Judas Iscariot to the Jewish authorities who then falsely condemned him for blasphemy and demanded that the Roman authorities execute him as a common thief. He died, he was buried in a tomb, and then he rose again three days later Paul and his fellow apostles took these facts of his life, his death, his resurrection, and by the inspiration and power of God's Spirit, they explained Jesus to be the Christ, the Messiah of God, whom God declared through his prophets would come and deliver his people from bondage, but not bondage to Rome, no, from a far greater enemy, bondage to their sin. And so the word of the cross, it's not merely the reiteration of the historical facts surrounding the life and death of Jesus, but also the declaring of the significance of his death, the significance of who it was who died there, which is what we have in the writings of the apostles that make up the New Testament scriptures. So at the heart of this message of the cross are three straightforward assumptions. Jesus Christ assumed the debt of your sin. In his death, Jesus Christ bore the full penalty of your sin. And all that is required from you is to turn from your sin, trust only in this Christ who died and rose again to secure the full and irreversible pardon from all your sin. And Paul proclaimed this message to all men everywhere. Jew and Gentile, slave and free, rich and poor. He proclaimed it as the only way by which they can stand righteous before God and know his favor and blessing. If you would ever know the blessing of being forgiven your sin, you will know it only through believing the word of the cross. In seeing and believing in the necessity of Christ crucified as the only means of atonement for your sins and being justified before a holy God. Such a message, Paul says, it was rejected as offensive and foolish to many who heard it in Corinth. And it's no different today. The, shame, the, shameful mess, or the same message of the cross, it offends our modern sensibilities. It is foolish to us. It's worthy of being mocked as a myth of a less enlightened 
superstitious age when morally bankrupt leaders of the church used fear of damnation to control a less educated society for the sake of their own power. See, that's all it is. That's all religion is. Some demon even, some demon even worse, though. They go even further to mock and scorn the cross. Some have said that any God who would brutalize and kill his own son for the crimes of others is guilty of cosmic child abuse. Such notions of salvation are as antiquated as curing illnesses and diseases by bloodletting or leeches. We don't need a Savior to be crucified so God will forgive us. No, no. Actually, God wants us to forgive ourselves. God wants us to believe in ourselves, to start living according to our potential, and He's there to help us to be the best that we can be. See, that's the gospel that's being preached today, and that's not a gospel. The message of the cross is totally at odds with any message that reduces God to nothing but a glorified life coach that minimizes our guilt before God and need of a Savior or tries to remove the offense of the cross and make it somehow more acceptable to men. To minimize the ugly reality of our sin is to remove that which is most offensive about the cross. That's why people don't preach it. It's offensive. You don't gather a crowd by preaching about sin. A cross stripped of its offense is a cross stripped of its power to save those who hear its message. But as Paul shows us here, when the word of the cross is preached in all its offense, it leads to an outcome as significant as it is unavoidable. The final reason why the cross divides the world's population is because of the inescapable judgment of the cross. One judgment belongs to man. The other belongs to God. Let's first consider mankind's judgment of the cross. Paul boils it down to two contrasting judgments. The contrast is not between power and weakness, right, as we would expect. No, it's between power and and foolishness. And this is a hint. God's power is not to be associated simply with miracles or with muscles or might. God's power is spoken of in different terms here. So let's look at the first judgment of the cross. The word of the cross is foolishness. That's, man, that's one part of man's judgment of the cross. It's foolishness. Paul uses the Greek word moria, from which we get our word, you can hear it, moron. This sums up the evaluation that the word gives the message of the cross. Right? For the people of Corinth, the cross was an assault on the values of power and glory and honor and success that they held so dear. Just saying those words, power, glory, honor, success, you can't link that only with Corinth, can you? Sounds like America. Power, glory, honor, success. Those are very American ideals too. We're not too far from Corinth, are we? Anyone who would worship as God, someone who died in humiliation and weakness, is a fool. But I, I don't think though we can reduce the world's contempt to just a purely an, an intellectual defect or, or a lack of wisdom, like, you know, they're a little dumb in the head. See, we can't reduce it just to that, as if that's what the world thinks, because that's not what the world thinks. That's not all the world thinks, because more is in view here with this idea of foolishness. Justin Martyr is more on track when he describes the offense caused by the message of Christianity to the ancient world as madness. It's madness. You're not simply an idiotic fool for worshiping a Christ crucified. You are a deranged fool. There is something wrong with you. What is glorious or praiseworthy of a God who was overcome and died in abject weakness? What possible benefit can come from worshiping a Savior so incapable, ineffective, and pathetic, and who expects me to see myself the same way. 
There is so clearly nothing of value in a crucified Savior who dies in weakness that it's folly. And one who embraces its message is a fool and you need to have your head checked. But there's another judgment by men of the cross. The word of of the cross is the power of God. See, Paul equates the cross with the power of God. Now, in the Old Testament, God's word, uh, God links his word to power. For example, in Jeremiah 23, 29, don't turn there, it says, Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer which shatters a rock? See, he often linked his powerful acts of creation and redemption with his word. And here, Paul says, the word of the cross is the power of God. But the power of the cross is not simply sheer force, right? When we hear the word power, we know, you might know, it comes from the word dunamis, from which we we derive our word dynamite, explosive power. That's, That's really not what's in view here. We don't equate it with force or the power of a mighty army here. That's not what he's talking about. The things that man accepts as powerful, right, like the might to rule an earthly kingdom, the ability to turn stones into bread, the power of your words to persuade and manipulate belief. But Jesus rejected all those and more. Those are all ways that man seeks to be powerful, seize power. Such things give the appearance, the appearance of being effective. They can draw a crowd. They can get a following. But they do nothing for the soul except further damn it. You see, for Paul, power is to be seen as that which is effective. Effective how? Effective to save. Effective to overcome sin. Effective to be godly. Effective to be transformed, to be set free. This power is demonstrated not by might, not by power, not by persuasion, but by lives changed by God's Spirit. And so the same cross that the world sees as utter foolishness, Paul says, no, that's the power of God. See, this is man's judgment of the cross. But Paul says that there is a greater judgment that precedes man's, which is God's judgment of man. That's the second inescapable judgment, God's judgment of man. And the the world of Paul's day was familiar with a number of, of polar opposites. People were either Roman or barbarian. They were Jew or Gentile. They were slave or free. They were male or female. And society was anything but equal and classless. The cross, though, it changed everything. The word of the cross has brought a judgment in its wake. It has divided humanity into two groups that have absolutely nothing to do with race or gender or status. And as a result of the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, God has decisively judged and condemned this present age. It is coming to an end. And he's in the process of doing that, bringing it to an end. And those who belong to this age, those who belong to its ways, those who embrace its views, God's judgment is that they are in the process of perishing with it. They're perishing. On the other hand, those who are being saved are in that blessed state as a result of God's power, a power that God made available only through the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. How does Paul say that they came to be saved? Not through their wisdom, not through their estimation of what they think God should be pleased by. I think God's pleased by this, and then they go off and do it. No, that had nothing to do with it. Paul says it was through faith. Verse 21, God was well pleased to save those who believe. 
Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. But don't miss this. Don't miss this. Before you or anyone else chose to believe on Christ and were saved, God says he first called you to himself. That's the sovereign electing grace of God. The only reason that you came to see the cross to be the power of God and the wisdom of God and not something ineffective and foolish like the rest of the world sees it is because as verse 24 says, you are one of those who are the called. He called you. That's why you came. That's why you believed. See, the cross has drawn a line right down the middle of the world. And every human being is on one side or the other. And on one side, there are those who are perishing. They're the ones to whom the word of the cross is foolishness. The word for perishing, it means to be ruined. It means to be destroyed. And notice that the word is in the present tense. Paul didn't say that on that side is those who will perish ultimately. He didn't say that. No, the present tense, it means that the perishing is in progress. It is the present road those are on who reject the word of the cross, but it's not necessarily their destination. And this means you who have a loved one who doesn't know Christ, this means there's hope. This means there's hope. You have a loved one who thinks the cross is foolish, thinks all those who embrace the cross are fools, there's still hope for them. Keep bringing the crucified Christ before them because that's what God will use to expose the foolishness of their own wisdom. He alone can do that. Cry out to him. But on the other side of this line, there are those who are being saved. And again, this is in the present tense, showing us that it's a process. You're in the process of being saved. In other words, you don't look right now what you're going to look like in the end. Paul speaks of salvation in three different tenses. There was a point in time in the past when you believed you were justified before God and sin's power was broken. There is a future day when you will be glorified, saved completely, forever free from sin's presence. But right now, you are being saved. And God is daily sanctifying you as you refrain from practicing sin. So with the Corinthians, Paul knew God was in the process of still saving them and sanctifying them for his purposes in the world. And the same is true for you. That means you're going to make sinful choices still. So don't be surprised by that. Don't despair because you're not where you think you should be spiritually. Let me just ask you, do you, do you see the evidence of God's power in your life? Power that delivered you from your past. Power that has transformed you. You're no longer what you once were. You're not what you're going to be. You're not all that you wish you were, but you're not, what you, you're not what you once were. What is that? That's God's power demonstrated in you, and you can praise God for that. But, but also, don't think you've arrived. I don't care how spiritual you are. I don't care how much Bible knowledge you have. I don't care what role you play in the church. He's not done with you yet. You will never move on from the cross. You will never not hear, need to hear about Christ crucified for you. I needed it then, but not anymore. You never move on from the milk when you don't even understand that it's milk. It's the gospel. There is a meteor substance, but if you can't grasp that you always need that milk, then you never move on. You'll never be so spiritual that you don't need God to be saving you. Now, I want to boil all this down so that we understand how the cross divides the world's people. This is an illustration that that when I heard this passage preached many years ago by my pastor, he used this a similar illustration, and it's never, I've never forgotten it. Let's say you've got a family with three children. Throughout their lives, growing up, two of those kids, they were always successful in school. They were popular amongst their peers. They did well in whatever they endeavored, sports and clubs and things like that. They went on to college and excelled. They landed great jobs. They married great 
spouses, they had kids. They are the picture of what every parent wants for their child. And, and their parents would take pride in these two children. But then there's the third child. He's the black sheep of the family. He did poor academically. His friends were no good. He got into lots of trouble. He didn't even try going to college. Right? He found a basic job, married the girl he got pregnant. In the eyes of the world, he's a loser. But then that loser heard the gospel. And God saved him. He started attending church. His wife got saved. And bit by bit, his life began to change. Not in the ways the world values, though. He's, he's not a lawyer like his sister. He's not a Wall Street broker like his brother. He doesn't have a big house. He doesn't drive a nice car. And his siblings, they still look down on him. He's still the black sheep of his family because he was foolish enough to go the route of religion. Hey, we're happy it changed you, but... But this black sheep of the family who embraced the cross is not on Prozac. He doesn't need a drink to make it through the day. He doesn't need to see a therapist to figure out why he's unhappy. And his marriage isn't on the brink of divorce. He's still foolish, though, in the world's eyes. But God has demonstrated his power in him to free him, to deliver him, to save him, and to sanctify him. How do you see the cross? What is your response to the message of the cross? Is its message offensive to you? Are you ashamed of it? Do you reject the cross because... You can never die to yourself. Why? Because, because you long more for the world's wealth and fame and power than for Christ. See, you need to understand what this means. It means you are perishing. And as Jesus explained, you have passed through the wide gate and along with many others in the world, you are on the broad road that leads to destruction. And if you realize what I am talking about, then there is hope. And that hope is this. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, became a man so that he could stand in your place and he could absorb the full penalty of your sins as he died upon that cross. And if you will turn from your sins, if you will believe on him and what his death accomplished, you will be saved. You will go from one who was perishing to one who is being saved. This is the gospel, and this is how he demonstrates his power through the gospel. He takes losers like you and me. He takes people who think they were wise in their own estimation, and he humbles all of them and then raises them up to life again in Jesus Christ because they embraced his son who died on that shameful Roman cross for them, that shameful cross that the world sees as utter foolishness, you now know as the power of God. Amen? Let's pray. We give you thanks, O oh God. We give you thanks. We did nothing. We did nothing. You opened our eyes. You called us to yourself. You showed us your beauty and we couldn't help but believe. We stand amazed in your presence that Jesus, the Nazarene, would take our sin upon himself and die. Let us be proclaimers of this foolish message. 
proclaimers of the cross of Jesus Christ where our Savior died. For only in that will we be able to see the power of God demonstrated in the lives of those we love. Glorify yourself in saving sinners. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.